the ministry may be smooth now. You and your wife, you and your husband may be on one accord now. Your portfolio can be stable now. The anniversaries are doing fairly well right now. Uh, the finances can be up right now. But the undeniable reality of this rather forbidding and foreboding analysis of the human condition is that in all of our lives, when, when, not a simile, when, not a homily, when, not hyperbole, when, not metaphorically, when, not hypothetically, when, not hyperbolically, when, not figuratively, when, not subconsciously, when, not imaginatively, when, not parenthetically, when, literally, in all of our lives, hell will break loose. We're blessed to be a blessing, a life to make a difference. There's hope for my brother, hope for my sister, life more abundantly. Hello friends, I'm Dr. E. Dewey Smith and I'm so excited that you've tuned into this segment of the Living Hope Broadcast. It is my prayer that you're blessed by today's broadcast. So many of you have reached out to us and I want to invite you to come worship with us in the city of Atlanta. Whenever you're visiting ATL Hot Atlanta, come by and holler at us. We're about 15 minutes on the east side uh, from downtown Atlanta. Come by. I'd love to personally meet and greet you. I stand down every week after the service I want to shake your hand and meet you personally let me know if you've been watching the Living Hope telecast today's message is transformative I hope it blesses you as half as much as it blessed me being able to deliver it be blessed today by the Word of God you're watching Living Hope be blessed so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the West and his glory from the rising of the Sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. I want to talk tonight from this thought when all hell breaks loose. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord when all. And all hell breaks loose. It was in the year 1300 A.D. that the Tuscan prophet by the name of Dante, prior to his exile from Florence, penned a missive called Divine Comedy. With the threat of exile in present proximity, Dante wrote in a, what is a paradoxical and an oxymoronic manner. He's faced struggle and now his life is facing severe challenge and change. And yet he finds the ability to be comedic during a moment of bondage. Dante combined three of his prior writings to write about purgatorio, Inferno and Paradiso, perhaps on Good Friday of 1300 A.D., and he poetically wrote about a context in which he envisioned himself journeying into the deep recession and recesses, rather, of hell. He talked about the nine concentric levels of hell, and he remembers taking and recalls taking a 24-hour journey that led him to the ninth level of hell. And after getting to the bottom of hell, he penned about a journey to get back to land. And it states that while he was on the ninth level of hell, that the Roman poet Virgil came and took his hand to act as a tour guide to lead him from level nine of hell to some type of upward mobility. Somehow, as he was being led by Virgil to get out of hell, he got separated from Virgil and a sister by the name of Beatrice came along to step in where 
Virgil had left off. Subsequently, he was dislodged from Beatrice, and then Bernard of Clairvaux appeared on the scenes to get Dante to where he was originally. And as he wrote about this divine comedy, he talks about hell being somewhat of an experience that is akin to retributive justice. And simply he records that often the level of hell that we experience in our lives is based on some things that we did prior to going to hell. It's interesting because he seemed to suggest that our hellish situations are all varied, transient, and different. And many of us in this room tonight, if we lift Dante's estimation as reality, that many of us tonight are at different levels in terms of a hellish predicament. There seems to be some type of connection, if you will, between the writings of Dante and our text tonight. Because as Dante talks about going into the lowest chambers of hell because of deeds done prior, it seems that the nation of Israel is in a situation like Dante. Hell began to break loose for them around 605 BC when Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt was run from Egypt by that Chaldean military genius by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Hell intensified in levels two and three of hell. It was experienced by those ancient Jews in 597 and 596 BC during the first and second carryings away of Israel into Babylon. It was during the reigns of King Jehoiachim and King Jehoiachin that Nebuchadnezzar came back into Judah, came back into Jerusalem and stripped thousands of Jews away from the land of their nativity. And then they reached level nine of hell in 586 BC. When Nebuchadnezzar returned to Jerusalem, burned the city, burned the temple and led these ancient Jews off into a period called Babylonian exile. There in Babylon where they faced with deplorable conditions. Once again, they were required to make brick without straw. Uh, these ancient Jews were treated in a very savage context from those Babylonians. So debilitating was the condition there in Babylon that one writer in recollection of those experiences says, by the rivers of Babylon there we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows thereof because while we were there in Babylon, those antagonists required of us a song, and our response was simple. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Uh, that context for those ancient Jews was quite severe. But somehow, some way, like Virgil came to assist Dante in level nine, around the time when the Persians, being led by King Cyrus, came and those Persians were more protagonistic toward the people of God. Ultimately in 536 and 520 BC, King Darius I allowed these Jews to get back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. And so as Bernard of Clairvaux, as Virgil, as Beatrice led Dante from the ninth level of hell, now these persons have come along the Persians who are more protagonistic toward the people of God and they are making their way back to a level of safety and security. But it is in this context that Isaiah records that although Darius and although the Persians would be protagonistic toward the people of God, they would only provide temporary relief because nobody could bring them back to a place of prominence, preeminence and popularity without there being a messianic mandate. And so Isaiah records, for unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given, his name shall be called Wonderful. Counsel of the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so he writes here in anticipation of a messianic reality in the midst of their Babylonian exile. And what Isaiah says to these ancient Jews and says to us through the annals and archives of history is that although we have a hope that may be eschatological, 
that may be messianic. The reality is in between our predicament and our existential and eschatological hope in all of our lives, hell will periodically break loose. Uh, I've come tonight in these postmodern times and how fitting is it that we've gathered for the E.K. Bailey Conference because it appears in my own estimation that hell has broken loose amongst the clergy. It seems that we have been so challenged in terms of our preachment in terms of how we will serve the present age, in terms of maintaining our standards, maintaining our stance, maintaining our positions. How are we to minister relevantly and biblically when the Bible is always relevant? But how are we to properly gauge this postmodern society? I'm here to tell you hell has broken loose. And what Isaiah says to us is that when hell breaks loose in all of our lives, it's very important that we find hope because like these ancient Jews had temporal hope with the Persians and ultimately Jesus Christ, you and I can have hope in spite of the various predicaments that we may face. Number one, he talks about in this passage in one verse. He talks about here, get this now, he talks about the absolute certainty of hell breaking loose. For he begins verse 19 by saying one word, when. When here could be an adverb, it can be a conjunction. He says, when, not if, not maybe, but when. The ministry may be smooth now. You and your wife, you and your husband may be on one accord now. Your portfolio can be stable now. The anniversaries are doing fairly well right now. Uh, the finances can be up right now, but the undeniable reality of this rather forbidding and foreboding analysis of the human condition is that in all of our lives, when, when, not a simile, when, not a homily, when, not hyperbole, when, not metaphorically, when, not hypothetically, when, not hyperbolically, when, not figuratively, when, not subconsciously, when, not imaginatively, when, not parenthetically, when, literally, in all of our lives, hell will break loose in our ministries. And I believe I have a witness here tonight that when hell breaks loose in your life, that we understand that it is not a new reality, that hell and struggle and doctrinal differences have always been a part of the Christian experience. Please don't believe that anything that happens now in terms of revelation should be new because if your revelation is new, then it is not true. There's always been a struggle with issues. It started there in Nicaea. When Arius wanted to espouse that Jesus was of a like substance and not the same substance as Jesus. So he had to gather there in 325 to argue over the issue of homoousius versus homoousius to declare that he's not of a like substance, he's of the same substance. I said when. It, it dealt when Tillich had to respond to Bart uh, about his nuances of existentialism. It is not if, it's when. It, it, it was the same thing, brothers and sisters, when Cone had to deal with those who felt that he dealt with some type uh, of justice and liberation that did not include those whose skin had been darkened by the king of the solar system. I said, it is when. And in all of our lives, in all of our ministries, you've got to, to gird yourself to be prepared to let us know in spite of your homiletical prowess, in spite of your degrees in academia, some things will happen in life, in your ministry. It's an absolute certainty. He deals here with the absolute certainty when. But he also here deals with the adversary who causes. He says, when the enemy. I hope you're being blessed like I've been blessed. I gotta take a break now, but I'll be right back. Don't change that channel. You're watching Living Hope. Have we become our enemy? Have we opened the doors uh, uh, for scrutiny and the bony thing of accusation to be pointed at clergy because of decisions that we have made? Is this hell self-induced? 
Was it because you decided to have 50 members and made 48 of them armor bearers? That the aroma of narcissism and elitism has now overwhelmed your ministry? Have you put yourself in that own context? In a day in a time where our evangelistic pursuits have been halted by a gospel that offered cheap hope and never wiped away any costly tears, a gospel that promised people things that God never said, how will you and I handle the aftermath of the storm? Every time someone invests, every time someone's a partner with us, they help us to reach other boys and girls, to reclaim them uh, from child sex trafficking. Whenever someone invests in us, they help us to touch the young boy, the young girl uh, who has HIV. They help us to minister to the woman who's been battered, or the child who's been battered that has nowhere to go. So they help us to go out and make a difference in the world. Partnering with E. Dewey Smith Ministries connects you to a growing global outreach, touching the lives of the battered, imprisoned, sexually abused, and needy. But by partnering with us, you really become partakers and not just part of the responsibility, but also the blessing. So we're just excited to have persons who want to make a difference for Christ. We're excited about people and transform the world. Impact the world with your partnership with EDS Ministries. Your monthly donation of $25 or more helps to impact the lives of thousands. Join Carpenters at Work. Become a partner with E. Dewey Smith Ministries today. Because of wonderful people like you, people around the world are hearing the Word of God. Now there are three possibilities about who Isaiah is referring to. When the enemy. Some have suggested that perhaps this enemy here is a reference to Satan. Because some hell that's in our lives is satanically produced. Was it a reference to the Antichrist? Was it a reference to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar? There is some inconclusivities regarding the exact identity of who he's referring to from a satanic perspective. But he says Satan here can be the enemy because some hell is uh, satanically uh, produced. But then sometimes the enemy can be self-induced because sometimes in all of our lives and ministries it is not that the hell that we are experiencing that it was satanically produced, it was self-induced. Because in a real sense, Israel will have to face Babylonian exile, not because of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, but because of their own apostasy and hypocrisy. Their sin has placed them in this context. And how often in our lives do we become as clergy and as Christians our own worst enemy? Uh, could it be that the hell that you're experiencing in your ministry is not because of perpetrating preachers, tricky trustees, devilish deacons, mean mothers, crazy and confused choir members, and ugly acting ushers. Could it be that the hell that you're experiencing in your own life is because you engaged in the building program trying to keep up with the preacher down the street with no providential direction, and so now you're struggling now because this hell has been self-induced. Maybe God has taken his hand of favor off of you because instead of having your heart perfectly postured toward God as you once did, you remember that time when you would preach the gospel and you pay someone to let you preach. But now that you have eight sermons, you send out eight page writers and have to have a certain type of peppermint, a certain type of water, a certain type of handkerchief in order to proclaim God's word. Could it be? Could it be that the hell that you're experiencing, that it is self-induced? Some hell is satanically produced. Some hell is self-induced. But ultimately, directly and indirectly, hell can be sovereignly introduced. Because in a real sense, nothing can happen to us that the divine does not already authorize. Perhaps this is a case of what H. Richard Niebuhr the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr once called a case where God has to anthropomorphically become our enemy in order to become our friend. Uh, does God allow Babylon from an indirect sense in order to get Israel to put her focus back on God? And in all of our lives, my brothers and my sisters, we have to ask ourselves the question, have we become our enemy? Have we opened the doors uh, for scrutiny and the bony finger of accusation to be pointed at clergy because of decisions that we have made. 
is this hell self-induced? Was it because you decided to have 50 members and made 48 of them armor bearers? That the aroma of narcissism and elitism has now overwhelmed your ministry? Have you put yourself in that own context? I want to say that I'm concerned about the state of clergy because in a day in a time where our evangelistic pursuits have been halted by a gospel that offered cheap hope, and never wiped away any costly tears, a gospel that promised people things that God never said. How will you and I handle the aftermath of the storm? And so the agony and chaos comes. But what I love about Isaiah's writing is he suggests that if Israel is able to hold on through dealing with Babylon, if they're able to deal with making brick without straw, he says, yes, when? Absolute certainty. Uh, the enemy, the adversary who causes it, shall come in metaphorically like a flood, agony and chaos. He says, fourthly, there are some actions that make us conquerors. He says, when, absolute certain, the enemy, adversary who causes it, shall come in like a flood, agony and chaos. He says, get this, the spirit of the Lord. Can I deal with that for a moment? And this is why I believe that this passage is best understood with the flood being a reference to the divine and not the demonic. This is why I believe that the comma is correct in the King James and should not come after the word in. Because what he seemed to suggest, capture, capture the sequence and the idea. When the flood waters come in, when the enemies come in like a flood to cause agony and chaos, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit shows up with actions that make us conquer us after the agony and chaos. This, this, is, this, is a, this is a blessed word because understand, in New Orleans, when Katrina came in, uh, the problem with the record of Katrina is when Katrina came in, the word that they had was FEMA. You, 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 you missed that. You, 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 you missed that. Uh, the word that they had is Mike Brown, George Bush, Condoleezza Rice. When Katrina came in, that was the activity. But isn't it wonderful that when hell breaks loose in your ministry, that the Ruah, the Spirit of God, that same Ruah that moved upon the face of the waters, that same Ruah that becomes the Numa, that Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I'm so glad that even with my own preaching, I would drown in my own preaching if the Holy Ghost didn't show up. And let me say, as we depend on getting exegetical skills, as we try to become always homiletically attractive and hermeneutically accurate, don't you get so caught up in your tools that you omit a devotional life and a dependence on the Holy Spirit. Because I don't care how sound your exegesis is, if the Holy Spirit, if the preacher does not anoint, somebody help me here. Uh, there have been times in my own ministry when I thought I had every I dotted and every T crossed homiletically. Stood with such a confidence knowing that this horse was going to ride. Only to stand before God's people and die on my face. But other times when I was weak, wounded, didn't have the time to focus like I wanted to, voice was not shown like I wanted it to, it was in that moment when I couldn't depend on my own exegetical skills, Holy Spirit, unless you show up. If we spend more time in preaching with the Holy Spirit than we do with our haberdashers, Somebody help me around here. If we spend more time trying to be righteous for Sunday rather than shining the Rolex for bling bling, when we rely on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit becomes that operative when there's agony and chaos. But not only does the Spirit show up, he says the Spirit of the Lord, get this now, shall lift. When, absolute certainty, the enemy, the adversary who causes it, shall come in like a flood, agony and chaos. The spirit, actions that make us conquerors. The spirit appears, and once the spirit appears, 
Isaiah says that when hell has broken loose in your life, the spirit lifts. Now this, this word presented uh, a hermeneutical challenge for me because when I did some linguistic analysis, I noticed that the word lift here in Hebrew was not in the manuscript. The word lift is used in some other verses, but I couldn't find an accurate translation of lift here. And what I discovered was in my studies that the word lift here, the idea in terms of floodwaters, was perhaps even borrowed from the French as a redaction. Uh, because interestingly here, the word lift here is not found in the Septuagint, it's not found in the Vulgate, it's not found in Hebrew. What I, what I found, what I discovered is that this word here literally is the word levy. My friends, it's my prayer that you've been blessed by our broadcast. And if you have, let me hear from you. Send us a card, connect with us on social media, consider becoming a partner with us, or why don't you order this message and sow it into somebody's life. Invest in kingdom development. You know somebody needed that word. Be a blessing to them, sow it into their life, and help us to carry the gospel all over the world. I need to hear from you now. Do it right now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Do it now. I gotta hear from you. I'm out of time, but I'll see you next time. Remember, you've been watching Living Hope. God bless you. I love you. Peace. Be transformed by Dr. Dewey's message. Have we opened the doors uh, for scrutiny and the bony thing of accusation to be pointed at clergy because of decisions that we have made? Is this hell self-induced? Was it because you decided to have 50 members and made 48 of them armor bearers? That the aroma of narcissism and elitism has now overwhelmed your ministry? Have you put yourself in that own context? Order your own copy of this message today on CD or DVD when you visit our website or call 877-894-HOPE. Download the new E. Dewey Smith Ministries app today in the iTunes Store or Google Play. Connect with us wherever you go on your phone, iPod Touch, or iPad. We have lots of great content to empower you. You can stream live and connect with us all within the app. Download today. Meet Dr. E. Dewey Smith in any of these great locations. Sunday, May 15th at Windsor Village United Methodist Church in Houston, Texas. Tuesday, May 17th, for Perfecting Fellowship International at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Thursday, May 26th at Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. For more information on any of these great events, call 877-894-HOPE. Next time on Living Hope. It's at that, that moment that the Holy Ghost comes to be a leather to literally damn up every attack of the enemy. And is there anybody around this house can thank God for the moments when your enemies tried to destroy you, thought they were going to take you out, and out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit lifted.